Okay, so let's talk about anxiety. So a couple different things about anxiety. Number one, it affects a lot more women than it does men. Um, it can be situational. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why you can have anxiety. The good news is, is that we have therapies, we have treatments, and we have things that we can do to help patients when they're struggling with this uh, feeling of anxiousness. Um, as we get started on our conversation today, I just want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind three important uh, hormones that we have to talk about. Number one is serotonin, the second one's norepinephrine, and the other one is dopamine. I want you to think of these as being your happy guy hormones, because if we have our happy guy hormones kind of in place and doing what they're supposed to be doing, then we have a lot less issues with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. A lot of our mental illnesses that we have are related to an imbalance in either serotonin, norepinephrine, or in dopamine. Here is our learning opportunities for this little snippet more learning opportunities for this little snippet. Okay, let's talk about Mandy. So Mandy is a 30 something year old female. She works at Texas A&M University and she got laid off because of budget cuts, all right? In her exit interview, she had some negative comments about her work performance that really surprised her. She's worried about how she'll meet her bills. She's been on several interviews but is not able to secure a new position and has been four months. She reports every time she goes into a job interview now, she almost panics. Her heart starts to race. She has a hard time breathing. Just making it into the building to have an interview is very stressful. The last two interviews looked really promising, but she had to reschedule them at the last minute because she felt so bad. Mandy has anxiety, but there's lots of different types of anxiety, and let's explore those next. So there's different types of anxiety, and based upon the type of anxiety that you have, we know that there's certain pharmacological treatments that actually work better for some people than they do for others, just based upon the type of anxiety that they have. So you can read over these and kind of look through them and kind of stick them in your brain. You're going to need them for a little bit later on. Here's our other types of anxieties. They do consider obsessive compulsive disorder to be a type of an anxiety. It's pretty interesting. I used to work with a, a professor. And um, every time that they would leave their office, they would jiggle the handle one time and it would be like two times, three times. And again, it seemed kind of interesting that that was a repetitive behavior that this person had. I'd never seen that before. Um, the ones on here for panic disorder and phobias, I think phobias are always the interesting one of what people are really afraid of. Again, I had a friend of mine, she used to be terrified of frogs. I, I'm like, what did a frog do to you? Anyways, but a panic disorder, I think that's probably the worst one. Um, whenever all of a sudden you feel like you're going to die because your autonomic nervous system takes over because inside your body says you are going to die. Now, your head's trying to rationalize it out, but your body's kind of like taken over and has really gotten you into the situation to where you just can't get out of it. It's, it's pretty scary for someone who's got a panic disorder. Um, had a young gentleman that came in. Um, that was big boy, lots of muscle sitting on the edge of the bed. He looked intense, like, you know, 90 foot stare. He was about to come unglued with a panic disorder, with a panic attack. And he knew he was. And so he sought treatment in the emergency department. He's like, I just need a milligram of Ativan. And he would yell. He was yelling at us. And I'm like, okay, okay. And the doctor was kind of being a, a toot and didn't want to give it to him. But I'm like, look, just give the man a milligram of Ativan. Okay, it's not like he's asking for the world. Give it to him. Let's get him calm back down because right now he got the devil in his eyes. He's going to go off. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, with these patients, we used to think that these were only revolved around like our soldiers or um, people who had had uh, like, uh, well, mainly it was mainly war. But now we're realizing that people can actually develop post-traumatic stress disorder from a lot of different things, whether it's childhood trauma, natural disasters, um, all of these patients uh, tend to have a little bit of PTSD. Now, how they, it also depends on how they perceive their PTSD. Uh, some people are like, no, 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 that don't bother me. But then whenever you put them in a situation that's very similar to the situation that they were in, they go off or they begin to get anxious or they become aggressive because of that. These patients also have an increased risk of suicide. So we really want to identify these patients, have them self-identified, help them to identify themselves in order to get them appropriate treatment so they don't commit suicide in the long run. 
we always like to talk about our non-pharmacological med, med, uh, implementation versus our pharmacological interventions. Our non-pharmacological interventions revolve a lot around mitigating or eliminating the cause of the anxiety. If we keep saying, I don't have anxiety, I don't have anxiety, that's part of the problem. You need to admit that you've got anxiety. Um, one of the things that we can teach our patients to do is when they become very anxious, is we teach them about how to, to use their five senses. So it's a really simple exercise. Um, you look at the patient and you're like, look, 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 look at me, look at me. Concentrate on my face, now tell me. All right, now then, tell me five things that you can see in this room. Now tell me four things that you can touch. And when you're touching them, I want you to explain to me what they feel like. Then I want you to, to tell me three things you can hear. And then I want you to tell me uh, two things that you can smell. And then finally, tell me one thing that you can taste. So what we do is, is we bring them back into themselves because typically with patients who have anxiety, the world has become so incredibly overwhelming that they're processing through a million and one things. And what we need them to do is need to bring them back down and need to get them to process into one thing. So we get them recentered, and then we talk. We're like, okay, now tell me what's the problem. Okay, we gotta get them recentered and do that. Um, other things there too is that we can have them do some meditation. Again, becoming quiet. Sometimes I tell patients that when their anxiety is really bad, the first thing I want them to do is I want them to walk outside. For some reason, not having a ceiling over the top of you or walls that surround you makes you feel more open. Um, and because of that, it can help to decrease anxiety. <gasps> Sorry. <laughs> now, some people that doesn't work. Some people you take them outside, it makes the anxiety worse because they need to feel the confinement. It just depends on the patient. Um, herbal products, there's lots of different things over the counter that we can give for anxiety, like kava kava, those sort of things. The problem is we have to be real careful because a lot of times those medications will interact with other medications. So we have to think about that. Massage. I wish somebody would order me a massage on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm going to need you to go get a massage. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll go get a massage. Um, exercise. I feel like when we're anxious, if we have all, well, not, I don't feel like, I know that when we are anxious, we have all these extra hormones running around. Remember, we talked about norepinephrine. It's going to be really important to our discussion. Norepinephrine is part of our fight or flight response. So we get this buildup of extra hormone inside of our bodies that if we're not using it, it's just sitting around making things go. It's like, <laughs> so we need to put some force, some energy to help kind of get rid of that extra hormone to kind of bring us down into a pace of peace and respondence. So we typically have talk about anxiety kind of having two different phases. And um, we think we talk about the anticipatory anxiety. You felt this um, when are you are getting ready to take a test. OK, you know, the test is coming and then you build the test up and then you have to go park in the parking lot and then you have to walk to the building. You anticipate and you're building up your anxiety. If we can nip anxiety in the bud there, then we have much more control over it than if we get to the second stage where we're actually having the physical manifestations of anxiety. I have um, lots of uh, experience with students and having test anxiety. They, I talk to them um, and they're like, I've got the information, but then I walk into the room and I forget everything I know. I'm like, okay, well, physically what's happening to you? And they'll talk, they're like, all of a sudden I get short of breath, my heart rate goes up and I just, I can't concentrate and I can't think. That's testing anxiety. That's a physical response to something that in your head, you're like, this isn't gonna kill me, it's just a test. Why am I so freaked out about that? That's anxiety. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that all anxiety is bad. In fact, some anxiety is actually pretty good because it actually helps to kind of tone us up and to make us ready to go and to make us fight or flight and get done what we need to get done. But whenever anxiety overwhelms our coping mechanisms, then that's when we need to work on it. Very, very important that uh, number one with anxiety is that we don't allow our negative thoughts to overcome our positive outcomes, okay? So sometimes um, I have to coach myself with anxiety. And the reason I have to do that is because I have allowed the world to pile things on top of me that don't need to be piled there. I have this sweet little friend and uh, <laughs> she's just this angelic looking little lady and um, 
she works with some really rough people and she just keeps a super positive outlook on everything. And I'm like, one day when I grow up, I'm going to be like her. But she told me this story one time that her son had been watching a movie and it was like a, a war movie and the guy had fallen down behind enemy lines and he, he'd broken one leg and, and, and he, and the, 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 they couldn't get to him, the, the the recon people and I told him that he his extraction point was like so many miles away and he was injured and he was hurt and so he would draw a line in the sand that he was like you're going to take yourself to that line and that sand and that's no bit and then he called himself a little something that you shouldn't say out loud well the sweet woman <laughs> told me as I'm getting ready to take my national certification exam she looked at me and she goes you quit being a little fill in the word and you get in there and you take it because you're a smart person. You're not stupid. And that's my anthem to you guys for the rest of your nursing career is you're not stupid. You wouldn't have gotten this far if you were dumb. Okay. You're not dumb. You're not stupid. Okay. You got to have good coping mechanisms though. So the great news is, is that with our pharmacological interventions, we always want, now remember, we're always going to do non-farm before we do farm. Um, we do have medications that are uh, going to help to decrease some of the excitation, excitation, slow the brain down, okay? Um, with these medications, at low doses, we get relaxation. At high doses or too high doses, we tend to get a lot of death. And that tends to happen more with our medicines that we'll be given for insomnia than for anything else. Um, and I apologize, yeah, this, see, yeah. This right here where it says OTC before RX, that's a great thing to say, but that melatonin stuff, that belongs on the insomnia slide, so you can just forget that part. Uh, with our pharmacology pearls, things that you want to know about these medications is you always want to cautiously administer any medication to any patient with the following issues. If they've got a cardiac history, respiratory issue, renal impairment, liver impairment, glaucoma, or a previous history of alcohol or drug abuse, we should always be thinking about when we're giving medications that are going to change their hormonal balance, what is that going to do to those target organs in particular? Okay, so these are the patients that I'm always looking out for. I'm like, what kind of problems you got? And they start listing them off. And then I'm just like, okay, medication therapy for you is going to be hard because we want to make sure that we're not making any of those issues worse by the medicines that we're giving you. So when we talk about medications to treat anxiety, we're basically talking about medications that are going to help to balance out our norepinephrine or our serotonin, or maybe even a little bit of both. These are the medications that we would typically see given for patients who have anxiety. I will tell you that with the beta blockers, typically when we give those patients those medications, it helps to decrease some of the physical manifestations of, of stress so that the patient can feel like that they can cope. So, you know, we talked a little bit about earlier about testing anxiety. I had a very good friend of mine that went through nursing school, um, and this was back in the day when the state of Texas would only allow three attempts for your nursing boards and then you didn't get any more. So took her exam the first time, got all 265 questions, failed. Took the exam the second time, got how many of her questions, failed took the exam the third time, actually in between the second and the third time, she went and she took her LVN boards and passed that. She had one more opportunity to take her RN boards and she failed that. So then in the state of Texas at that time, her only option was that she then worked as a year as an LVN. Then at the end of her year working as an LVN, went back to nursing school and completed her RN degree. Got her through. I remember like teaching and listening to her. She had it, it was all in there, it was good. We got to boards, took boards the first time and failed. I'm like, dear, what is, the, what is the problem? Every time I walk into that test, I am so fearful that I cannot think. My heart races, I, I start sweating, I can't think. She had test anxiety. She went, she visited with her primary care physician and they talked it out. And what he did was is ultimately put her on a beta blocker. Because if I block your betas from being able to respond, then a lot of these uh, reactions of panic aren't gonna happen because we're blocking the beta, okay? So on the day before the test, she took a beta blocker. On the day morning of the test, she took a beta blocker. Only time she ever had to take them, okay? We weren't using them for blood pressure control. They were using them to control her anxiety. Okay, 
So here's all the different classes of antidepressants. And now you're, you're, you're like, wait, wait, we were talking about anxiety. I know. But remember, I told you that anxiety tends to be an imbalance between serotonin and norepinephrine or both. So we use our antidepressant medications to help to treat anxiety and depression. So we kind of get a big bang for our buck here. Every one of these medications, no matter what class they are, are in, they all have the risk of, inc of increasing suicidal ideations and suicide follow through. Now you're like, wait, again, I'm confused. Okay, so if we have a patient who is super anxious and anxious to the point of being incapacitated, like, like, okay, like I can't do anything. I'm just so anxious. They just sit there and they cry or they're in a ball. We can't get them to go anywhere. When we begin to give antidepressants to these patients for anxiety or even for depression, in the beginning, they are uh, incapacitated. They really can't think through things. They're very um, almost immobile. Okay. They're not literally, but figuratively immobile. When you begin to give them antidepressants, okay, and all antidepressants take time to work. If we're going to give an antidepressant today, it's not going to reach its full effect until four weeks. But in that meantime, the serotonin and the norepinephrine levels, they begin to, to rise and to regulate. We give them just enough energy to think about and to want to contemplate and to actually carry out a suicide plan. So very important that when we're starting medications, especially antidepressants, for patients who have anxiety or patients who have depression, that we are monitoring them for suicidal thoughts, that's called ideation, or a plan, okay? They're more likely to commit suicide in the first one to four weeks of the onset of medication because now they have the energy to actually go out and to do it, okay? So important uh, fact about our antidepressants. Um, again, always stressing to your patients that I want you to feel better, but I need you to know that this medication is not going to be instantaneous. It's going to take one to four weeks to reach its full effectiveness and for you to begin to feel better. So again, making sure that we're tailoring this therapy, that we're talking to this patient. We cannot give a drug to treat anxiety, depression, schizophrenia if we're not gonna also offer the non-pharmacological interventions to go with that. They've gotta be, patients with anxiety and depression need to be in counseling. They need to know these cognitive behavioral therapies. They need to be able to say to themselves, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that helps them to compartmentalize and to break down a very large problem into smaller bites or to smaller pieces that they can then manage. We have to tell them they have to take time this is going to be time so that we make sure that these patients understand that it's not just a one pill and done. That increased suicide risk, we let the patient know, we let the caregivers know so that we can make sure that they are being watched and that they're talking and that they're listening for those key words. <clears throat> if you have a patient that all of a sudden becomes obsessed with death or making funeral arrangements or is looking at coffins online, these are things that you need to be aware of. Uh, we do have an opportunity now with genetic testing um, to test patients to determine what is the absolute best medication for them to be on for their depression. It's amazing, guys. Let me tell you how amazing it is. It's so amazing <laughs> that Medicaid pays for it. That's how amazing it is. Guys, Medicaid doesn't pay for anything, but Medicaid will pay for the patient to have genetic testing to determine which of the Pharmacological therapy will best target the patient. Pretty cool, huh? Almost every one of these will cause some sort of sexual dysfunction. So if you got a guy, okay, I know girls, it's important for us too. However, it tends to be more um, thought provoking, um, disturbing for the males whenever they aren't able to complete. Um, ejaculation will be a big issue for these for this gentleman. So it may decrease a woman's libido, but for a man, for a man, it can be um, quite disheartening for that sort of stuff not to work anymore. I wanted to talk to you about suicide precautions. Um, I will tell you that it's quite interesting what people attempt to um, commit suicide with. Um, sometimes if our patients are severe enough, we do hospitalize them so we can provide this safe environment. It's so interesting, um, a couple of years ago, we had, when Rock Prairie Behavioral Health first opened, 
we had the nurse manager come out to our campus and was visiting with us. And um, as part of their room assessment that they did on our, just our standard classroom, he says, I pick up that there's about 52 ligature points in this room. I was shocked because I would have never thought that there was things that in our classroom that you could use and to order it to inflict harm or on yourself. Um, he even went as far as to point out that the door hinges could be used as a ligature point. Again, crazy things that I just don't think about, but just something for you to put in your hat for whenever you go forward with patients who are starting on the antidepressive medications, figuring out what their suicide risk is. Let's talk drugs. I like drugs. All right. So we have our patient in therapy. We they've come to the office. Um, the therapy is in session, is is working for them. And now we need to talk about what kind of medications would be best to put um, to be for this patient to take. So the first medication um, that we'll talk about is a tricyclic antidepressant. This medication is going to help to balance out that serotonin and norepinephrine. We have lots of different uses for this medication besides just anxiety. Also for depression, insomnia, chronic pain, fibromyalgia pains, headache, back pain. These are some good drugs. Now, in particular, clomiparine. Sorry, I'm, more coffee. <laughs> is a specific therapy for um, obsessive compulsive disorder. But for the most part, everything else on here could be used for any of the different reasons. You'll see here with the side effects that they look a lot like our anticholinergic medications. So this might be one of the things that you just kind of warn patients about. So in the beginning, when tricyclic antidepressants were first made, one of the things that they thought that they were really good for was as an antihistamine. Well, as you can see, um, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, it is actually standard out like an antihistamine. So I have um, a chronic disorder called histomatosis. Basically, my histamine and uh, reacts really quickly in my body. So I take a tricyclic antidepressant. So I have to convince people that I'm not depressed. <laughs> I just take it in order to control my release of histamine. But I will tell you with this medication, the dry mouth and the dry eyes is pretty serious. I take a very low dose. I take like a 10 milligram tablet. But um, in the morning times, if I sleep in my contacts, and yes, I can do that because I have those contacts, I literally have to go and like squirt saline in my eyes because my eyes are so glued shut. The therapeutic dosage of amitriptyline for depression actually can go up to 100 milligrams. So for those patients, I can't imagine what they're feeling like with the sedation, the dizziness, the orthostatic hypertension, and the dry mouth, because there's a bottle of water by my bed, because if I don't take a drink about two o'clock in the morning, I get up and I can't get my lips apart. Um, one of the bad things about this medication is, again, do you see down here in that red box? That red box talks about things that are really, really bad that can happen with this medication. Heart block, MI. So if you have a patient who has already has a cardiac history, and then you put this medication on top of them, we've got to be very cautious to make sure that we're not going to cause their cardiac issues to go and to be a lot worse. This medication does have a long half-life. I will tell you that sometimes these pa patients will tell you that they don't take this medication every night, and so they take it every other night, depending upon their dosage and what they're taking it for. Here's a little way to help you to remember about those tricyclic antidepressants. It did get its name because of its unique three cycles or three rings that were all jammed together, tricyclic. Um, and then here is your little uh, suffix list. Again, more information about your tricyclic antidepressants. I love these little things. Sometimes I'll get into a test and I'm thinking about it and then I start, start seeing this little guy on the tricycle. I'm like, oh yeah, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, with the tricyclic antidepressants, it's probably not our most popular medication for uh, anxiety or depression or for much of anything. We do have better medications now that we use, but you're still going to see these out in practice um, on occasion. Probably, I say you see them more often than not um, with our patients or mental health, pop pa mental health population. I will say because that extra long half-life, Sometimes if the patient's at risk for suicides, 
they don't want to give the Tricelix because they can, they do have that really long half-life. So if they overdose on it, then it takes a really long time to help them to recover from the overdose because you just kind of have to watch it and wait it. Okay, we're going to talk about monamine oxidase inhibitors, also known as MAOI inhibitors, okay? So before we can have that conversation, let's have this one. Monamine oxidase is a substance produced by your liver whose job is to convert norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin into inactive products. So this medication, um, this hormone literally is degrading, taking away our happy hormones, our norepinephrine, our serotonin, and our dopamine. So scientists thought, well, you know what, since we know this, if we just prevent that uh, uh, substance from ever doing that problem, then we'll we'll be out, we'll be on the clear. We'll have all these happy people around us, right? But MOA, MOA in the liver also serves to inactivate tyramine and other amines in foods. Literally, this chemical is a killjoy um, kind of a guy. By stopping MOA from destroying your happy hormones, we get to be happy. But this medication comes with a lot of precautions. Like I said, every TV commercial you hear on TV in relation to a drug will say, if you're taking an MAOI, you cannot take that medication. So we invented this drug, thought it was really great. And you know what? Honestly, it works pretty good to control a lot of different things for neurotic uh, and for patients who are neurotic or have atypical depressions, um, patients who are uncontrollable, anything else in this world they'll look at doing one of these MAOIs. However, with the tyramine, if the tyramine substance is not allowed to be broken down, tyramine will build up to an unhealthy blood level in your stomach, and then that's whenever the patient becomes very, very hypertensive. These patients have to be, have to be compliant with their medication regimens and have to be willing to follow the list about medications that they should not have a lot of. These medications, Nardiol, Marplan, and Parnate, again, if we go to these medications, it is because everything else has failed. Uh, with these patients, uh, they're typically hard to manage because we've gone through everything else. And again, lots of nasty side effects with their MAOIs. We don't want our patients to eat foods that are high in tyramine. So no cheese, no wine, no pickles, no fermented foods. If they eat those medications, and then within about 10 to 15 minutes, they're going to start sweating. They're going to have tremors, dizziness. Their blood pressure is going to go up really, really fast. They're going to get this horrible, like, occipital headache all back in here. And then they're feeling like their heart's going to beat really, really fast. So with those patients, again, if they're willing to follow the dietary recommendations for not eating tyramines, then we can put them on the medications. And like I said, if we're looking at an MAOI, it's because we have looked at everything else and this was the last resort so now here is where you need to put your bulk of your life at whenever you talk about antidepressive medications and that's with our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors this is the most popular of the medication classes it is the one that's most frequently used out in society you're going to see this quite a bit um I will tell you that some medications, they, they, all these medications pretty much work the same. There are some patients that they say, well, I took, um, I took the paroxetine, but it didn't really work. But the last time, but if you put me on citalopram, it works even better. So like one of them may work better than the other, but they all have about the same efficacy. It's just that sometimes patients prefer one over the other, and we're willing to try that with them. Um, Again, these medications don't work with MAOIs. Warfarin with your, uh, I wrote TCA, I can't remember what that stands for, or lithium, and we'll talk more about lithium in a minute. This is we tetracyclines, but don't hold me to that. Uh, with these med pet medications, there is one big huge that you need, things that you need to know about. Number one, it's going to cause some sexual dysfunction. Ladies tend not to be so disturbed by this, but it really upsets the dudes. So make sure that you warn the patient about that and talk them through it. We're going to make your depression better. However, we may make something else break.
here's this wonderful little slide, again, helping you to see all those different um, things that uh, SSRIs can do for you. And then hopefully they will make a, this picture will help to kind of stick into your brain so you can remember this for your upcoming exam. So closely related to the SSRIs are our serotonin and norepine reuptake inhibitors, also known as SNRIs, chemically similar to our SSRIs and have a lot of the same side effects. With this medication, what we find is, is that, again, some of these medications just work better for these patients than, they, than the SSRIs. One of the benefits that we have with our SSNRIs is that sometimes patients find that the side effects are less common with an SNRI than they are with a SSRI. So if you find that to be true, um, maybe recommending to the physician, to the provider, to say, hey, let's change them from an SSRI to an SSNRI. <clears throat> Either one, SSRI, SNRI, we need to withdraw these medications slowly from these patients if we're changing therapy or gonna be doing something different. The reason being is because there can be a problem as the body tries to re-upregulate up its own serotonin levels. Um, one of the patients, or one of the complaints that patients typically have when they're coming off these medications is that all of a sudden they'll start to get paresthesias of like their hands and their feet. So they get some numbness and tingling of their hands and feet. So we want to withdraw these slowly. So serotonin syndrome is what happens with a patient whenever you begin to give them um, SSR, SSRI or SNRI. It's one of those things that can happen really, really quickly. Now I have a very improper statement here on this slide, but I say this because I want you to understand you do not get to be crazy unless you are healthy and crazy. So we have patients come in all the time and I think that we look at them as health providers because we can get a little jaded sometime after a, long, after a while and we think to ourselves that is just an old crazy man. He, crazy. He's just crazy. No, you don't get to be crazy until you're healthy and crazy. There's so many disease processes that can mimic mental illness that we need to make sure that we are excluding those before we just say that patient is crazy and not doing anything with them. Again, I have a hard time whenever patients tell me or people tell me they're like, oh, that's just us. That's just the way they are. I listen with a grain of salt and then I go in and just like a good nurse would, I go in and assess that patient, make my assessment, make my plan of care based upon the information that I have discovered about this patient not based upon what somebody else is telling me. Our atypical depressants, antidepressants. Now, sometimes you'll see in books, they'll have atypical antidepressants and they'll put the SNRIs underneath that same category. I don't like doing that. To me, it's confusing. I, my SNRIs, I have a very clear picture of how they work. I will tell you that your atypical antidepressants have a little bit different mechanism, so that's why I separate them out. So we try people on SSRIs and SNRIs first. That's probably our first number one therapy. But if that doesn't work, then we go to some of these atypical ones. With these atypical ones, we have uh, a reuptake of serotonin. It also affects the norepinephrine and the dopamine. So we get all three of them. All three of our happy hormones are playing together. One of the cool things about atypical antidepressants, especially with bupurion, um, it works not only for depression and anxiety, it also helps to work for smoking sensation. So as a pharmacy tech back in um, college, and one of the things that I used to do was um, fill medications for patients at Walmart. So I'm filling medications, uh, Bupurion had just come on the market at that time, and uh, we literally had the Wellbutrin on this shelf and the Zyban on this shelf. The difference was is that the Wellbutrin was $32 for a fill, but the Zyban was $175 a fill because it was for smoking sensation. Exact same pill, but just marketed underneath two different names. So always, 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 guys, be really um, diligent about making sure that you're looking at the chemical formulation of a drug because sometimes those chemical formulations of the drug will be something else that we've just happened to find out that there's another use for. Okay, so with bupurion, it is used for not only for depression, but also for smoking sensation. We would basically have the provider go back, rewrite the prescription for a Wellbutrin, and fill it for them for $32, and then they would stop smoking. So, 
Um, the other medication on here that I want to talk about is trazodone. You'll see trazodone quite frequently um, in the community, but we don't really use it for depression as much as we use it for insomnia. So if a patient's having a hard time getting to sleep, sometimes we'll give them trazodone and that makes a huge difference in order to um, help them to get to sleep. This is one of the only um, uh, atypical depressants are also known for actually having some like good side effects, like number one, no sexual side effects, okay? All of a sudden the boys are all happy no weight gain and then of course it reduces the need for nicotine here's our fun little slide all about wellbutrin and zyban again it was so funny giving these medications out looking at these patients like i need you to go back and have your farm your physician right for wellbutrin not zyban <laughs> we do have some other treatments for anxiety um, that we like to use for patients if they're having like an immediate kind of uh, anxiety right now. We already kind of talked a little bit about beta blockers. Uh, propanolol or atenolol is the one that they usually will prescribe there. The other one is an antihistamine called hydroxazine pamamate. Hydroxazine pamamate, you can give it to the patient 50 milligrams every six hours, and that medication will help the patient to feel more relaxed, more in control, um, it does a pretty good job, makes them a little sleepy, just kind of takes the edge off the top of the uh, anxiety. Another medication, it's a seizure medication, also known as Depakote, has also been, um, but Depakote slash Valpor Valporic Acid has also been known to reduce anxiety. If none of that works, then what we need to do is we need to think about looking at something called a benzodiazepine. So benzodiazepine is a medication that helps to actually affect the GABA in the brain, and it causes the CNS to actually physically be depressed. We have lots of uses for this medication, specifically anxiety, insomnia, seizure, muscle spasms, panic disorder, alcohol withdrawals. It really helps take the edge off. The problem we get is that these medications, the body really likes them. And so we can get physical dependence pretty quickly on these medications when they're used for a long term. So we want these medications to be used for short term. I will tell you that that is a problem. <laughs> there are lots of patients out there who really like the benzodiazepines. In fact, benzodiazepines have become so incredibly popular that they're sold on the street for all sorts of different reasons. People will take them in addition to taking something else, which makes a huge difference. Um, Medelazam on here, also known as Versed, it tends to be a drug of the stars, meaning that a lot of, this page, a lot of the stars uh, in Hollywood will take this medication, um, IV, so that they can sleep well. Here's a little chart that I found. I apologize for the funky looking picture, but what I like about this chart is that it gives me all of the great uses for my benzodiazepine. So for instance, um, Xanax is really good for GAD, which is general, and a lot, uh, general anxiety disorder, and can also be used in panic disorder. So it kind of like lays out like how they work the best, depending upon what the patient's medical diagnosis is. Finally, um, I always like, I like this little chart that comes out of a book. It talks about the way that anxiety kind of, kind of quote unquote, winds you up. So you have an event, you get short-term anxiety. If we change the way you think, we can get to normal behavior. If we eliminate the cause, we get to normal behavior. But if we don't, anxiety becomes this very cyclical thing that eventually can lead to um, uh, increased activity, lack of sleep. And at that point, we need to intervene with a medication in order to get that patient back to that normal behavior. If we don't, and we keep having these changes in mentation, changes in mental condition, that's when we step in with our pharmacological therapies. All right, guys, this is everything you need to know about anxiety and those antidepressants and benzodiazepines. If you have any questions, please post them.